Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Spotlight on White Papers, the Do's and Don'ts webinar, organised by Ditto, the marketing, business development and communications company for the financial services sector. My name is Michael Imsen, and I'm a senior content editor at Financial Times Live, the FT's conference division. I'm also a chartered member of the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment, the CISI, and the deputy chairman of the CISI's FinTech Professional Forum. Joining me here today for this discussion at Ditto's London offices are three experts who have first-hand experience of white papers. First, we have Mike Wilson, CEO and founder of Ditto and the RegTech Forum. Mike founded Ditto in 2008, and as an award-winning marketing communications and business development practice, Ditto has helped bring to market dozens of industry-leading clients, including Arcadiasoft, Majority, Invenega, and KX. Founded in 2016, RegTech Forum is a group of thought leaders with a special interest in financial regulation technology, working for regulated firms, their investors, and their service providers. Then we have Charlie Corbett, who has worked as a senior financial journalist and editor at the FT Group, Wall Street Journal, Euromoney, and Morning Star. His book, The Art of Plain Speaking, was published by Routledge in 2018. It won the best short business book of the year at this year's Business Book Awards. And last year, Charlie won the Plain English Campaign's Communicator of the Year. Finally, we have Richard Cook, founder and MD of Champion Communications, an award-winning business-to-business public relations company, helping technology companies sell more through media coverage. Champion is based in central London. Now, I'd just like to say a few words about the topic. Um, what exactly is a white paper? Now, it depends whether you're talking about a business white paper or a government white paper. In the business world, it's a short to medium length report ranging from about 1,500 words to maybe 10,000 words about a topical issue. And in financial services, that issue could be developments to do with a product, a service, a regulation, a type of risk, or one of many other topics. And the paper will present facts, analysis, opinion, and recommendations on the topic. And it will be produced by an organization with a commercial interest in the topic. And then it will be promoted or marketed to the intended readership who are the media, existing and potential customers, academics, regulators, and government policymakers. And these people are known as thought leaders, which is why a white paper is often referred to as a thought leadership document. Now, the term white paper originates from the world of government, where a complex issue is presented in an understandable way, policies and legislative proposals are set out, and recipients are invited to comment. The term originates from within the British government, and one of the best known earliest examples is the Churchill White Paper of 1922. And then the term was appropriated in the early 1990s by businesses to use as part of their sales and marketing strategies to other businesses. Now, it's important to stress that there are, uh, to understand that there are four organizations that can be said to have an interest in business white papers. The first are the white paper publishers. These are companies who use white papers to market their knowledge and expertise and services to other companies. The second group are the white paper content writers, such as Ditto. These are media, PR, marketing organizations, uh, freelance journalists that write uh, white papers for publishers. And then, although the publishers will often write the white papers themselves, um, quite often it's outsourced to these uh, other organizations. The third group are the white paper marketeers, publicists, and PR firms, such as Champion. Uh, they promote white papers to editors of magazines and newspapers, and the publishers, um, customers, and other organizations. Then finally, the fourth group, and most important of all, these are the people that read the white papers and use them, um, such as Charlie from uh, Euromoney and, the, and the various other things. Um, they're sent to editors who, it's hoped, will use these papers in their articles, podcasts, and webinars and other outputs. And uh, other readers will, as I mentioned earlier, would be um, the publishers, uh, potential customers, regulators, government policymakers. So I, I hope that um, makes it all um, understandable. Now, the format is simply that I'm going to ask um, our panelists some questions. Um, listeners will be able to ask questions via the webinar site, so please do send them in, and I'll try to get some of them answered near the end. There's a section on the website that uh, explains how to do this. So, um, first of all, let's uh, do some introductions, um, uh, in self-introductions. Mike from Ditto, can you tell us about yourself and your job and um, what your interest is in white papers for your clients? Well, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Michael. So first of all, myself and my job and the Innocent White Papers, actually, if, if I tackle that in three parts, we can just talk about the job and, and my own background. I entered the markets in 1988 in Arabo Winter Partners, developing, coding actually, a developer, developing a repo system in, in Asia based in Singapore. 
It ends up to bought up to Wall Street and Bankers Trust in '93, actually as part of a VC VC grid are selling the IP that, that firm had developed, then on to Deutsche Bank in '99, investing in technology, and then on 08, launching Ditto. So I think we're quite papers on what it means. The step change we've seen in technology in that space of time, I think, is driving a lot of this demand for total leadership. First of all, in tech, you know, it's build versus buy. Because the framework is more modular right now. Secondly, the sales. Firms want to treat their customers as a community. They, um, they have long sales cycles. They're very low volume and very high value. And they want the solution sell. And so that's, I think, where white papers, and it's a really mixed terminology, Michael, because we talk about ebooks, white papers, industry articles. So um, when we launched our firm 11 years ago, actually, white papers were very ad hoc. They were very unusual to get commissioned that way. Fast forward today, 11 years on, there's not a campaign that we launch, a company launch out a product that we go that doesn't have a white paper involved. So, so to round off, what does white papers mean for our clients and why are these brands becoming publishers? Um, I, I think they're doing it for a few reasons. One, it's flexible and it's cost effective. They're living assets that can be added to. I, I think it gives voice and personality to our clients and to the solutions. It enables them to start a conversation. And it can be a really clever mixture of their own company or a mixture of different contributors. And that can really aid a small firm that wants a halo effect they're working with a big firm. And they can really easily weave it into a campaign mix of events and webinars. And finally, they make the complex very simple. And you can measure these things, which I think then is going to be interesting the perspectives from Charlie, from Richard, of you know the, 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 the um, commissioning brand, the development of the content, and then what our PR colleagues and our, and our peers in, in publishing actually promote that stuff. Now, in the end of the day, it's all about selling. So our clients will tell you that they want to use these, these assets as a way of getting awareness and attention in a very clever way that will assist their sales pipeline and create awareness. So I think that's what I've seen to round off. Huge upsurge in it, massive shift. I think it's because of the way technology is being sold and the way people want to buy. I think people want to treat their customers as communities, and these are a the fuel source for that. Cool. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, Charlie, can you tell us about the work you're doing these days, journalistically, and also the book you've just written? And the role that white papers play in your business life. But they've always, <clears throat> excuse me, they've always played a part. I was uh, obviously a journalist first, so I was a receiver of white papers. I was the person they were trying to raise awareness from. So I had a lot of experience um, from receiving a lot of white papers, many of which were, were, were sort of fell at the first fence, uh, often just in their headline. Um, so then I was a journalist for about 12 years. I left the Wall Street Journal where I was editing the special reports section in Europe and started a business exactly that, helping companies articulate, as, as Mike was saying, complex ideas in a way that was easily understandable. I am a cynic, I'm today a cynic on white papers. Um, and so I did that for five or six years, then I went in to help Euromoney, which is an independent publishing house, um, Euromoney magazine, Global Capital magazine, uh, who wanted to start, a, a, I suppose, a branded content business within that. So to take the skills of independent editorial and then apply those to helping businesses um, write white papers that people will actually read. So if you want someone to read it, hire a storyteller to, to, to help you tell your story. Um, so that's my, my experience of, of white papers. I suppose I've been in the communications business, both as a journalist, um, I suppose both sides of the fence work in the corporate world for 20, getting on for 20 years. I wrote the book after five years of running my consultancy. Uh, it's called The Art of Plain Speaking. It started off as a bit of a rant, really. I mean, I was brought in by companies, again, to help them articulate complex ideas in a way that was easily understandable. And the problems that I found was that companies thought they wanted a journalist to come in and help tell their story. But actually, what they wanted was compliance to say it was all right. And that was the main driver. And, and what I wanted to do, I found the way people spoke, the way people described their business, um, they were not getting the messages they want across because they were drowning everything in jargon and, and buzz speak, as we, we, we've discussed. Um, and I wanted to write a book that helped people. So the, the, the chapter structure was how to write well, how to speak well publicly, and, and, the, and how to deal with the press, and how to get your, your communications noticed. And, and, and the secret of all that, of course, is, is plain speaking, is, is short words, short sentences, avoiding jargon. So, so that, um, that's what I continue to try to do. That is my... I see it now as my calling. I'm, I'm determined to, <laughs> Thanks, to thank change you. mindset. Thanks, Charlie. Well, there'll be plenty of opportunities in the next uh, 50 minutes for me to ask you about some um, pearls of wisdom that you can uh, communicate to listeners. Uh, Richard Cook of Champion Communications, can you tell us about your role and your interest in the topic of today's 
webinar as a promoter of white papers to the media. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Um, we are focused entirely on helping our clients sell more, and we do that through earned media. White papers are a useful tool that can be part of that process. Actually, um, our relationship as a PR consultancy um, is often centered around campaigns. And as Mike said, there's many campaigns that we also produce which have got a white paper within them. Um, quite often we'll start off with maybe an idea, a piece of research, and we'll then create various different assets, whether it's media briefings, press releases, blogs, and a white paper may be an asset that's created, um, which is maybe the more heavyweight piece of content, that is, uh, and it's a format that is used to deliver um, perhaps a more concentrated version of the campaign. Um, I think the term white paper, white paper is used to give gravitas to something. I don't know if it always deserves gravitas, but I think sometimes the term is, is, is used in that purpose that way. We don't find that white papers are useful for journalists, but they can often be used as a asset to validate a, um, a, a piece of press coverage. And, and quite often it's used as a piece of gated content within digital environments that our, our clients are using. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Um, still on you, Richard. Um, what would you say makes a white paper useful from both the publisher's point of view, the person, the company promoting what it's got, its wares, mm. and the reader's perspective? I think. Uh, the most simple way to answer that is the word consequence. The most valuable asset that any business has got is the willingness of the audience that it's looking to sell to, to be interested. And I think we, if you're a brand and you're, you're compromising that by putting poor quality content out under the title white paper, I think you're mortgaging future interest by doing that. So I think that they, they um, the, the role of a white paper is to really reward and thank and enrich um, the, the reader's day-to-day -day life. And you can only do that if it's got consequence, relevance, and, and can really make their lives better. Yeah, yeah. you used the term gravitas earlier. I've been sent white papers which look more like brochures. They're a bit thin on content. The designer's gone mad with it and put loads of pictures in, which I think devalues it. So, Mike... Um, what makes a white paper useful from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think first of all, I think we're, we're right actually, and Richard Simmons here, I think if we kind of remove the label white paper for, for a moment, because it is badly labeled and misused and abused, mm -hmm. and, and let's maybe talk about what's the good way to start a conversation. If you're selling technology, in our case, we are a marketing development practice in technology. It's extremely noisy. It's very difficult to get awareness. But folk want to have a conversation. So, so a really great way of doing that is altering an asset that people can contribute to, that people can <coughs> engage with to start a conversation. Now, we've done white papers that are much more, I don't know if anyone's involved in, in crypto land or blockchain. So, so they're very plain white paper, you know, how they, how they look. And then to deal and scale, scale you know, we've published white papers for clients recently that are very graphically driven with infographics and highly visual and highly engaging. So I think the answer to the visual output has to suit the tone of voice of the client and who they're speaking to. People operate in different ways. And so it's getting that balance right. But absolutely couldn't agree with Richard Moore in consequence and, and you, Michael, to gravitas. If you're just calling something a piece of content for the sake of doing it and ticking a box, you're not really you're mortgaging the future, as Richard said. But um, I think to, to um, and also to Charlie's point, plain speaking, Start the conversation, know the outputs that you want, know who people want to contribute. It's not a one off thing. Mm -hmm. Make a part of something, and then it'll give the desired output that you want. Yeah. yeah. And Charlie, you've had many years uh, as a journalist, as an editor from different financial publications. Um, what for you makes a white paper useful to build into your article? Either well, I don't background or. Yeah, I agree. I agree with everything Mike says about you know, rebranding. If someone comes up to me, <laughs> comes up to me and says, Look at my white paper. I'll <laughs> um, it's got to have information that I can't get anywhere else. You know, it's got to tell me something new. I always say with anything, and this is why I think white paper is a difficult term, because anything you produce as a business has to pass the so what test. Mm. You know, would I get this information, would it go into my story? Because and if it goes into my story, I would be happy to tell my neighbor in the pub or the cafe, did you know? And that's the so what. And every time, everything you frame, obviously the first thing you do is you think about your audience, but everything from then you frame on, you frame, you know, 
am I saying something that they might not necessarily find out elsewhere? And the vast majority of white paper you meet, especially the longer ones, will be full of, of ballast, really, um, that, that is of no great use, but sort of steady as a ship and might look good. And there's a lot of corporate posturing and a lot of pompous language. But at the heart of it, I, taught, I learned as a journalist, you would get these huge, especially in the old days, you know, before the internet, you get huge papers, but you learned, or as a history grudger, <laughs> skit, summary, dum, dum, yeah. dum, 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 skit to the end. And if you're, if your aim, the aim of your white paper, as you say, Richard, there are different aims, of course, is to raise awareness, let's say, in the media, then you know, don't send them this, this massive budget, make everything quick and easily understandable, but to your original point about what makes it useful, information that I can't get anywhere else, that will surprise people and make them want to read my story as a journalist. Mm. Because white papers are up, written by companies are up against uh, genuine information that you and I would use as journalists, uh, reports from the big consultancy boys, um, surveys by uh, reputable universities, um, regulators' opinions, uh, white, uh, consultation papers on stuff. So a business white paper has got to compete mm -hmm. against all of that other genuinely useful information from regulators and academics. So Mike, um, moving on to the do's of writing <laughs> white paper, um, uh, when one of your clients decides it wants to produce a white paper and appoint someone to write it, such as, as your firm, mm -hmm. Um, how do you work with the client to decide on the topic and the theme of the topic and then write a content plan? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I guess we actually start with well, what's the desired outcome. So if this asset, this PC communication is to go out into the wild, maybe advertise through paid media, maybe advertise through LinkedIn, and its purpose is to create awareness to generate leads and to harvest email addresses. So. We've got a really great piece of opinion or a piece you can't find anywhere else that's very useful. Come to get it, but to download it, you need to offer up your email address, which will then pull into the sales funnel. If that's the target for the client, we figure out the best way of getting there. So sometimes for our clients, Michael, the best way of doing that isn't the client's own brand. It's actually working with those big four, working with other contributors, working with a panel of folk to say, well, this is the best strategy you've got is actually look at this as a 90-day window. Let's think about holding a breakfast briefing or a webinar with that. Let's think about putting a panel together. Let's think about what we're doing here, discussing something. So we give that insight. So actually the paper is part of an array of different assets that we would use. Now, when a client comes in and says, can you just write for me a white paper and we'll use it on marketing? It doesn't work that way. It, it is actually a very considered drumbeat over at least a quarter to two quarters. And then once you've got their email address and once you've had them put in part of your community, you have to serve them. You got to keep doing it, you know, or else they will unsubscribe and go away if you're bombarding them. Yeah, yeah, well, that's very important. Yeah, um, Richard, do you ever you, know, you promote the white papers once they're written? Do you ever get involved in the initiation? Yeah, quite often. Actually, the editor, my team, spends its time on the phone to people like yourself and to Charlie, um, pitching stories. And you know, to be honest, nine times out of ten, the answer from a journalist is that's not quite right. We don't want that. We want something different. So that knowledge is really useful when it comes to sitting down and creating a piece of content, knowing what the editorial agenda is, what the appetite is for things like facts and figures and the type of level of data that is going to be appealing can be really useful. So we do get involved with creating white papers. I have to say, though, that um, you know, anybody can draw if they're given a pen and a piece of paper, and anybody can write, but not everybody can do what Mike and Ditto do, which is to make a white paper really compelling and and engaging. And professional writing um, is is such a, a valuable and important and often underestimated ingredient in terms of creating this kind of content. Mm -hmm. And so um, we will work with journalists, we'll work with specialists to create something that um, passes that editorial so what test. Um, and um, then when we've got that, then we start to do things with it with the media. Yeah, yeah. Um, Charlie, what advice would you give to um, people listening um, who uh, might want to produce a white paper or certainly talk to colleagues in their company about producing a white paper? What specific do's do you think they would find interesting? Do, I think, which is absolutely right, not enough people do build relationships with the media, proper relationships, two-way relationships with the media and try to learn. They often think, because I've produced it, therefore people should write about it. <laughs> um, and that's not the way around it. I mean, I would say the do is definitely, well, the, the main do with all of this, sounds so obvious, know what you want to say, and then say it. That sounds so obvious, but it's really hard. 
The other thing I would say, the easiest way to do that is someone's going to own it. The problem with white papers often is that they go through lots of different layers, of stakeholders and compliance, and you lose the premise. It's the same as writing a story or a novel, anything. You need your press, so your what we call the Wall Street Journal, your nut graph. Every story that's written by the Wall Street Journal has this nut graph, which is the it's, essence. It's, it's what nut? The nut graph. So, you, so it's a story in a nutshell, that's what, and that's American <laughs> sort of lingo, sort of journalistic lingo, the nut graph. Where's your nut graph, Charlie? Um, so get your nut graph, your summary, in your head, and you've got to keep that in your head all the way through and remember that story. And if you've got lots of different owners, I know it's hard in businesses because everyone wants to be involved. The best way, and it's the age-old cliche about, you know, the camel is a horse designed by committee, too many of these white papers end up as camels. People in my business at the moment hate, keep saying to me, what's wrong with camels? Um, they're nice creatures. But it, it is true, it needs to be owned. And, and, then, and it needs to have a, a single message. And you need to tell a story. Everything is about telling your story and always trying to, because they get lost and they go down different paths and it doesn't matter how beautiful, as you were saying, how beautiful it looks or, you know, it, you, if you're writing engaging prose that people haven't necessarily heard, information that people haven't heard before, statistics people don't know, then people are going to read it from beginning to end and it doesn't really matter how long or short it is, obviously you don't want it too long, but say interesting things. Now, all, all stories have conclusions, but a white paper's conclusion probably should be quite active, proactive, a call to action, a recommendation. Always, oh, yes. Mike? Yeah, we find. I've mean, actually got to see when a camera becomes a Trojan horse. And I love to make a metaphor. <laughs> so, so look, let, let's be quite pointed about this. You know, people are spending their time, money, and energy in this because they want to sell stuff. They want to, you know, make people aware of them. Now, we know when we go into large sell side firms or buy side firms that they won't give a testimonial for a product that can't be seen through their compliance webs and do it. Yeah. But they will happily contribute their voice and lend our voice to an opinion in a conversation, a talk piece. So, 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 so you know, they're, they're often used as ways of bifurcating organizations and, you know, a way of guiding yourself through something. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly our clients, you know, we've got clients who are startup firms pre-Series A that want to create attention and they'll quite happily sit down and have a valid point to say with a large universal bank or a, one of the big four will happily contribute to a co-owned white paper or a co-owned discussion. And I think it comes back to people want to be part of the conversation. Now, the worst kind of thing to do is this. When people are doing it because they see their competitors doing it. I mean, you've all must have had this. I'm sure you've had a Richard saying, look, my competitor X is doing this. Shouldn't we be doing that? And I want to, or, or, or Charlie the same thing. And we have that. Clients come in and want to order one because, you know, Peter has one, so Paul needs one. And that's the worst kind of one because they're just aping and mimicking. Should, should a white paper have... Uh, well, how, how overt should the sales message be in a white paper? Because I've done them for Deloitte and EY, but they're not called white papers, they're reports, and they don't want sales messages in there usually. But some of them have to, and you definitely have to have contact details at the, at the back. So to what extent, Richard, would... would I think that's a really interesting question, mm -hmm. and I think that it depends on who you are. If you're a North American company selling to a North American audience, I suspect that the appetite for commercial messaging is different from that which we are in when we're in the cynical, um, fast-paced environment of London, where there's less media and there's more competition to get into that space, whether it's online or not. Um, so different in what way? I think there's, more the, sales there's, 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 there's less tolerance for commercial messaging within in the UK. a long-form piece of message mm -hmm. content in, in the UK. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that um, the most important thing is you know to look at a piece of a long form piece of content, which is what we're talking about here. Mm. Would your audience pay for that? If the answer is yes, then the chances are that they're going to be rewarded by investing their time in reading it. And if they find that reward to be relevant and useful, then absolutely have a response mechanism within that. Um, if it doesn't pass those tests, then you could be wasting everybody's time. But worst of all, you could be wasting your prospects' time by asking them to read something that's not going to add any value to their day. Charlie, what are the sort of sales red flags that you would practically well, spot in a white I think the one thing worse than being overtly commercial, I don't think you mind that really, you know, buy my oranges, they're juicy and fresh. No one minds that. It's disguising 
your message. Mm. It's pretending that you're getting all interesting right, and thought yeah. leadership and actually you're sneakily trying to, to sell. And that's unfortunately a great many white papers kind of end up as that amalgam because what happens is that the, the guy with the bright idea and the interesting story writes it and then, then the, the salesman or somebody gets it and says, hang on a minute, we're not selling it yet. Yeah? Put that in, add that. Mm. And then suddenly, and I, I had this experience working for co companies that you then get back this, this, this sort of mixed, well, mixed messages. So never mix your message. If you're going, if you're, think about your audience, think about the story you want to tell the audience. Now, if you, if it is genuinely interesting, it's genuinely interesting. And if you want it to be thought leadership, well, then your brand will be near it or somewhere near it. And, but it's an interesting story. Um, and you're not, you're, but it's, there's a purity to telling an interesting story. But, but, and there's a purity to saying buy my oranges, they're juicy and fresh. But that grey area in between is where a lot falls, I think. And then people, particularly in the UK, they don't like that. Say, 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 pretend to be one thing and say another. We, we've strayed into the second part. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, it's all right. It's my, my, my fault. Before we do, before we go into that wholeheartedly, the don'ts, are there any more do's, positive aspects? Yes, I'll be doing. Do's that we need to stress. They can't be one-off events. You know, so the do, I would say, the focus, do it. You know, don't be too precious about it. Do, be professional about it. But, but they're not, it's not going to be a silver bullet, Michael. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to look at it as a, as a starting of a conversation that has to be served correctly or a drumbeat you're going to create. So, so that would be a key do, I would say, to folk. There's no panacea. Mm -hmm. It's not like a, a silver bullet. Mm -hmm. Any more do's, Richard? One of the things that we have done recently that's worked out really nicely is speak to examples of the target audience mm -hmm. and find out how interested would you be in this subject? What would you want from it? And just Holding get a sense yeah. mm -hmm. um, of... of and the other thing that you mentioned earlier, Mike, was looking at competitors. Yeah. Um, I think copying competitors is never good, and being being led by them is not the right answer. But you can be inspired, and you see what's worked. Look at social engagement around other assets that competitors have put out, because that might give you an indication as to what's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, Charlie, any 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 more do's? Well, again, I, I would agree with the audience. I mean, do think about your audience very very hard always. Do think about your specific aims. Of the paper before you start doing anything and do um, think of three or four core messages that you want the world to know about you before you go anywhere before you even do anything else and that's what yeah, i think okay. we'll come back to some more do's later um i'm sure some will just uh, um emerge spontaneously but let's get on some don'ts um mike um what are the most important things you should not do when yeah white yeah so i i, I think it's you should there's a couple things you shouldn't do which is is um um one i think the problems we've had with white paper some white papers recently is that it was just far too complicated and you have internal smes that are extremely precious have a particular tone of voice that they like you know you're commissioned as a writer you're writing to be in fairness with your audience in mind but some subject matter experts within the firm aren't in sales and marketing they aren't in communication they're there because they're special subject matter experts on a particular topic and when you unleash these folk on the keyboard, they can, they can really steer something that isn't just nice to read. But because they're senior folks, so, so one of the don'ts is, is figuring out the roles, responsibilities of the tone of voice you want the end product to be, to, to, to um, Richard's point, who the end audience is, you know, who you want to speak to. So the don't is, don't, you know, go, don't get too carried away with your internal SMEs without setting that tone of voice and that copywriting because it can really steer you. You know, and, and, and end up with a poor asset, I think. And also, terrible, terrible internal markup sessions. If you, we, we, have a, we have a three cycle review process here. And don't get into the thing that you have the person kind of parachuting in from the, the field that haven't been involved in the process. You know, to go through another markup cycle, it's death by a thousand. I'm sure we've all been there, but like death by a thousand because it's like left. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, Charlie? I, I, I agree with everything that that Mike says there. I think it, it, don't, particularly don't let too many people get involved with it. It's got to be owned. I said that before. Don't let it go around the company, around the firm. Don't get everyone in the room. And and you know again, don't be long-winded. Don't use complicated language. Don't make it too complex. Also, there's this sort of danger always with these people think because it's business. I've got to speak in this sort of stiff academic. Way as I'm some sort of university don from the 1930s. Well, we are delighted to that. Right? <laughs> just speak, you know, just because it's a white paper doesn't mean you have to, can't write in a way that's understandable. I think everything you write, no matter what the audience, should be 
everything something your granny could understand. But, but, but unless you're a journalist, it's hard for a lot of business people and even academics to write. Well, this, this is trend. This is the they should buy my book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the tragedy of where business has become. It's like Japanese knotweed. Once this kind of way of speaking goes into a business. It's really hard to, to, to get it out again because it becomes the language. Like living abroad, um, you, you pick up the language and then you, you start using it without even realizing you're using it. And then suddenly you're a bit lost and all the messages get confused and complicated where you really, you know, clear, good clear language is like an ice cold glass of lemonade on a hot day. You know, it refreshes. <laughs> and that's what the reader's getting, refreshing, crisp prose. You think of all your favorite columnists in all the different newspapers and why you read them. Try to write like them. You know, aspire to write like that. Mm -hmm. Richard? So if, if you think about the white paper as the foundational piece of a campaign, then I think one of the things not to do when you're publicizing it is to assume that it's a one and done. It's not a matter of just placing that white paper in its existing form in your favorite business publication. I think it's about atomizing that content and finding the press release, for the, oh, the, the briefing, the long form byline article, looking at it as a source of material for different audiences and then um, tailoring it for each different decision maker in your, your, your audience. So it might be a vertical sector split, a business argument, a, a financial perspective. But if your white paper is, is the source, then don't just regard it as being a one-off asset, but, but chop it up. Well, do you have a view on how long it should be? I mentioned in my intro, 1,500 words to 10,000, but 10,000 would be the upper limit. Some would say it should only be three or four. Do you have a view on From my perspective, I can't think of any of my clients who are selling to people who would have the time or the energy <laughs> or the effort to read 10,000 words. Yeah. I just don't. <laughs> and so I think that, again, um, to the point that Charlie and Mike have made, is it has to be audience-defined. So what would the audience advertise the content be? Yeah, well, I've written reports for organizations which have gone up to eight, nine, ten thousand, but but they haven't been called white papers, they've been something else. They've used but at a pound a word, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> My rate's five pounds a week. I wish it were. <coughs> um, but for, for the don'ts, again, um, don't be afraid to do it. Right, so, so maybe another don't. You know, don't be too precious. Mm -hmm. Yes, you want to do it, and you want to have the gravitas, you want to have the purpose, but don't agonize over it. Mm -hmm. it. It is kind of yesterday's digital chip fish and chip wrapping too. So you know, don't get. And in the world of the internet, there's a lot of people talking, a lot of people shouting out there. So I, I would absolutely encourage you. As I say, 11 years ago, Michael, it was you know, maybe one, one white paper a quarter. It wasn't, you know, 11 years ago, everybody wanted physical events. We were going to physical trade shows. We were on big physical shows, big budget stuff. We were sitting down at the beginning of the year with a 12-month view. Now folk are looking at 90-day views, much more agile, much more tactical, really reactive, very opportunistic. They want to switch things digitally. <coughs> they want to, they want to turn, we would turn a white paper on typically in five to 10 days, you know, you know quick if we can, longer if it's more considered. So this is stuff that they want to be able to react to an opportunity. So so don't be afraid and grasp grasp the piece, and and would be another don't I would say. Um, yeah, just just go do it really. Because mm -hmm. without one of these things, I think you're firm without a voice. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I don't know what what how you'd replace it if you didn't have this type of method of engaging the shadow conversation. What would you do instead? Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 it's very hard to see how you're going to create the awareness. I think there's a place for white papers and press release and all the old fashioned, you know, the communication shadow bang. There's a place for all of that. But people have changed. Um, attitudes have changed. Millennials are coming through. People consume information in totally different ways. And also, I think people forget. Well, the two things, companies, it's very hard for a company to give an opinion because it always, a big company always has to go through its compliance team. So the lawyers always have to get involved. And I think if you want to, if your aim is to be a thought leader, mm -hmm. then you've got to say thought provoking things and you can't, white paper is part of that, but you need to be, let's say your, most of your customers are on LinkedIn, that's your area, you've chosen that. You can't just post the odd thing, we're delighted to announce we've hired, you know, George Jones or, or we're delighted to announce we opened an office in Addis Ababa. Mm -hmm. You, if you want to arrest people's attention, 
you've got to consistently be saying interesting things, putting interesting information, stats, sharing an article, being amusing. Re you know, people want an emotional reaction. They want to be intrigued. They want to laugh. There's nothing wrong with making people laugh just because you work in business. You know, you have to be serious all the time, um, you know, within reason, obviously. Um, but um, you, that needs to be constant, and that's hard work. And if you're doing opinion in the business, that, does it go through compliance? Does it, mm. you know, who's doing that? Is it the CEO or is that the head of marketing who's been given a remit within the business to be your face on LinkedIn? It's deciding who's going to be the one who tells your message, and that should be someone who's charismatic, um, someone who's good with the media, has found out who exactly their audience is. You were saying, Richard, has, has done their research into exactly the journalists that write about them. They can be, join LinkedIn or like, Twitter's a bear pit. Um, is you can put people's names on it. You know, hey, George Jones, the editor of this section of this newspaper, I saw this article. You know, then you're engaging and then you might start a debate. You see, actually, actually, Charlie, and we see the complete wrong show you guys have too, of now every one of our clients wants to sit in front of a camera. So they'll say, yes, we say, <laughs> yes, we want exactly. to support, love it. support yeah. leadership. Yeah. But actually what we want to do then is that we really need video. You know, we really need to get our folk in front of a camera. You know, that helps with SEO and Google and search terms. Also with the proliferation of smart devices and smartphones, people consume content with, that way. So oftentimes what we might do with a white paper is actually have a 90 second short blast right. video, a little mm -hmm. overview. Brilliant. It's a click baby, so okay, yeah. want to learn more, download the long form. Yeah. And as I say, if well, you yeah. weren't doing that, what would you, what would you replace and it I with? I think in that context, that long form white paper, if mm -hmm. nobody ever reads it, it doesn't matter because you've provided them with a synopsis in the format of a video or yeah. a blog post yeah. or a briefing. And it's some, the, the white paper is almost like the guarantee that <laughs> you've done their homework, it's there, you don't need to read the white That's paper, the here's, a, here's the yeah. digest version of it. But I, I remind you of that, yes, Minister Ruth, um, who really listens to Radio 3? It's <laughs> nice to know it's there. <laughs> um, validation. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny, we, we, we had a client in earlier today and uh, we were actually looking at our competitors and we're, we're, we've got some campaigns coming up and we would start actually looking at the competitive landscape because they're speaking to the same people we want to speak to and just every single client, white paper, webinar, video interview and sort of tons of content mm -hmm. where they clearly have got maybe an in-house team like warranted to do this, just a ton of stuff and you know when you, when you log on to a site you see 143 webinars you know, you see a bank of forty odd white papers, and we're disguised <laughs> as key books, whatever they are. But, but so, so clearly, there would, and you know, there, this, this, this is content that does find its audience. People find use in it. But, well, I think there's also a danger that we're talking about vanity publishing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that in many cases, executives um, doing busy work and marketing teams and marketing agencies doing busy work. And I think that. Um, it's now evident, it's very, very easy to be able to see who has engaged with a piece of content and the impact it's had. You can measure it. Yeah. Um, and if it's not working, I think it's, it, you, that's when you get the experts in or you change tactic. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that's a great opportunity. I see it as this great grey sea of corporate literature. And you have a great opportunity to be that colourful yacht sailing on the top that's noticeable, standing out. Because there is so much, as you were saying, there is so much. And if you if you if you say interesting things in an interesting way and and um, and, and, and intrigue people, then then they'll notice because so much of it is unnoticeable. You see these headlines that go on that are you know fifty sixty word headlines. You know no one's going to pay any attention. I've got a specific question for um, Mike. And you, your company recently published a short article headlined. Mm -hmm. Top five reasons why white papers win yeah, business. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not quite a white paper yeah. on how to write a white paper, mm. um, but if, cause it's quite a short piece. But if you add another few hundred words, it might be a <laughs> 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 the, the acorn that mighty oak will come from. Um, yeah. So, top five reasons. Can you give us a point of, on to, to oh, why that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Do you know can, can you tell me one or two of those top reasons? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the top um, reason, first of all, actually, you've said is the title. Did you know that odd numbers? And titles. When we publish an article or white paper and say top five things to do this or top seven things or top three to that, we will triple the click rate. Really? Unbelievable. Well, then if it was seven, uh, to send it, eight, yeah. Well, now that's past the so what so, 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 it's the, so it's the odd numbers and people love a list of things. And it's yeah, peculiar. <laughs> so if we said, you know, how to write a great white paper, you get X amount of click rate. You said top five reasons why these <laughs> things will really give you voice, <laughs> coaches, and I, CEO, those, those, those five things. And it's astonishing. So the first thing is actually get the title right. 
<laughs> so, 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 so the headlines are important, and also the, the, by adding numbers, people know how long it's going to take. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they yeah. Say, oh, that will take a quick read, yeah. five minutes, five minutes, yeah. blah, 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 yeah, yeah. quick information. Yeah, and you often find out. I don't know if you've seen like the top five things in top of CIO's mind this year. Oh, the top five yeah. things that have changed. Yeah, yes, but it's always odd for some reason. It performs better than yeah, the evening numbers. Very, very Bonkers, it? Right. Well, on the on the, on the uh, still on the theme of um, imparting pearls of wisdom, right. um, as as uh, I've already mentioned, <coughs> um, Charlie uh, last year won the Plain English Campaign's Communicator of the Year Award, and this year the Business Book Awards. Um, Art of Plain Speaking, you've, you've got the short business book award for that. So can you give us a, a few tasters from that book? Don't, don't tell us everything, because you want the people to go out there and buy it, possibly. Well, thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's interesting. I wrote it, it's, I say it started as a bit of a rage against, it was the antidote to business books, really, the antidote to business But actually what it turned into was a book to help people, to say, look, you know, the first chapter is how to come up with good ideas, you know, and that's not in meetings called called ideas meetings. You know, they come in lots of different ways when you're in the bar, when you're walking, making a piece of toast or walking down there. You know, they start as, as seeds planted in your deep subconscious. So there's chaps on how to come up with good ideas. That's what you have to do as a journalist all the time, every day. New angle, new idea. I want people to read my stuff. Um, and then how to write well, how to write clearly. Well, that's, you know, use plain English and then tell a story with a beginning, a middle and end. And then how to speak well publicly is a bit on, on nerves. It's ridiculous how you know, everyone, all the best public speakers obviously get nervous. I think if you say you're not nervous before you, you speak publicly, then you're not a very good public speaker. Um, so um, there's um, how to deal with the press. I mean, a lot of what we've talked about today, actually, you know, it's, it's, it's meant to be an all-in-one um, short guide um, for anyone who works in business and people outside of business. I've had people... Um, Mothers and things who live up in Scotland who go to council meetings and don't take the book with them. No, no, specific, specific advice, for instance, one of the things I first remember being told as a journalist was um, use active voice rather than passive voice. Absolutely. Because the cat sat on the mats rather than the. Well, I think the active, yes, I the prefer cat. the active. I mean, if you slavishly always use the active, but the point is get your message across, and the active sense is, is, the, is, the, is the best way to do that. Use short, you know, my old editor used to say full stops are free. Use lots of full stops. <laughs> You know, short sentences, use short words, you know, don't, don't, you know, people like to use a long word where a short word would do. Use the short word, always. Always, always think very hard about the person who's reading what you're writing. Imagine a single individual, and at the end of every sentence that you write, read it back to yourself and say, have I said exactly what I wanted to say in this sentence? And chances are you haven't. Can I make this sentence shorter? Yeah. What about avoiding tautology? So, for instance, you might, oh, yeah. might somebody might write... Um, this is an in-depth and comprehensive review. Well, they could just say this is a comprehensive review. Well, exactly. Oh, it's exactly. It is easier once you have the habit, said, um, said George Orwell, to say it is not an unjustifiable assumption that than to say I think. <laughs> yeah. And so it's all about it's, it's keeping it short. Be concise. Be clear. Think about what you want to say and then say it in the clearest possible way. And the best public speakers and the best writers that's what they do, and they also write how they speak. And I don't mean write how you speak in the corporate environment. I mean write as though you were speaking to an intelligent friend or your grandmother or someone like that. Um, there's no shame in that. There's no shame in getting your point across very quickly using short words. I think there's this great myth that we all have to try and sound clever all the yeah. time, and it doesn't work. That's true. And, it, and you're actually with your hiding. People hide behind this way of speaking. A, a specific question for Richard, which is about publicising white papers. You've touched on it already, but um, just to, to ask you very specifically, how would you go about uh, promoting a white paper to an editor um, or a group of editors and then trying to get it published? It's a great question and it's one that I got asked by a client recently. Do, do um, you, for instance, keep ringing the editor up to say, have you... Well, no, well, first things paper? first, I, just, I would always give the feedback to a client that the fact that you've published a white paper is not news. Do not expect that to get any yeah. editorial <laughs> because I'm not putting my team in front of the press telling them to write that story. Yeah. Now, within the white paper, there may be something of interest. And I always um, look at it from the perspective of target audiences, Mike and Natalia said, we're all interested in me and my problem. And so if you can find out what problem is being answered by that piece of content and write that and create a pitch for the journalist that is written from the perspective of their reader and their reader's problem, that's the rule that we follow. It's a f and find a news angle within the story. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that the white paper itself has been published is not a story in itself. Yeah, and it should never yeah. be something. 
people mm. like Richard made our lives as journalists easier because they knew about what we wrote about when our deadlines were, what the kind of stories we wrote. And so you had a symbiotic relationship whereby um, we were deeply cynical or, or PR or anything, but if you have a, a, you know, a good PR person, it's worth a thousand others. It's an open channel of communication in good times and in bad times. It's a partnership. And it's a, it is a partnership because you know, when, you, when you're Mr. Phil's space and I've got to try and find a story, you can phone up a, a good PR and say, well, actually, this is interesting. It's an angle here and I found this out. And, so, and no one else has got it. Um, and, and there's this carpet bombing approach, you know, where everyone's just yeah. sent up all yeah. I mean, day, every day. I mean, oh, it's just the expensive. So we, we had an, an, an unnamed client. We ran a really successful digital campaign. But it wasn't a, a white paper a piece of time. It was a piece of creative. I think we got commissioned about, about £25,000 in this particular creative work. But the media spend behind that was almost quarter of a million. Right. For the impressions I wanted. So, so, so the media buying was huge. And that yeah. across the NBC, Bloomberg. It was a fantastic successful campaign, but the creators of the asset actually got paid very little. So, mm -hmm. so another reason why people want to commission white papers is cost effective. That you're not going via paid media, you're going via earned media or direct using social channels or community to publish your voice. Mm -hmm. Paid media is expensive. Mm -hmm. But you exactly, you, you you can buy media, but you can't mm -hmm. buy engagement. Yeah, yeah, that's really mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, Mike, what about tricky clients? Now, be careful what you say here. Uh, you write <laughs> white papers for your clients. <laughs> right. But no matter how good you think your writers have performed, um, yeah. clients may have a different opinion and they might demand a more, um, well, lots of changes. Um, so, how, first of all, how do you manage the pride and confidence of your writers so they're not totally demoralized by all mm. these changes and negative yeah. comments that clients might make? And how do you accommodate your clients' requests? If, if they seem unreasonable? Yeah, it's, just two, it's a great question, actually. So how do we get to the end product? We've, we've developed, our clients are very time-hungry, uh, very demanding, and, and um, very results-driven. You know, this is fintech and technology. So we've had to develop a methodology to write the papers, and we start with developing a spine of a content plan. That content plan keeps the key points that we're trying to make with supporting points. And so it's actually quite mechanical, Michael, if we'll be told, designing the bones of the piece. The writers then a free reign to write. Now, but you know, if we've got demanding clients, uh, truth be told, you can't hide with this stuff because every bureaucracy has it been downloaded, you know, have I got email addresses, is it been circulated, you know, assuming that's a quality piece and it's doing that piece, they want to measure the thing. And so we have to stand, you know, live and breathe behind the numbers, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, so it, you can get very naked very quickly. Um, now, in terms of the writers themselves, you will get, you know, people are passionate and precious sometimes, but also in terms of internally with the client, you know, so it's the art, we get the science of it, it's the art to bring that together when we're all moving together, and it nearly always works out. Yeah. We haven't had many typewriters drawn at us yet, so, um, yeah. Okay, well, um, Charlie, we've been mainly talking to you about your um, skills in, in um, mm. writing white papers, also you as a consumer reader, as an editor of white papers. Um, but going back to um, you writing white papers and being paid by companies when they commissioned you, which you, you did when you ran Bluefinch Media. That's right, yeah. Um, how do you engage in a conversation with the publisher about going about this? And, and how do you arrive at the fee? You mentioned one pound a word, for instance. Uh, <laughs> but how, how do, do, you, wow. do, you, do you have a day rate and then calculate how many days it's going to take? Then, oh, well, well, you know, it, what happens is you, you'll say your day rate and then they'll cut down the days. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, a, it's to and fro. But I think what I used to do, you know, what my, my little game, corporate therapy, was to say, right, get everyone who's senior in the business in a room and say, right, who are we? And you have to articulate what your business does in a sentence. And you've got to be very clear. And then no one could. And it, it was this great battle. Well, actually, who are we? It was this existential crisis. But then you do it, it was quite fun. And then eventually they, you just say, have a sentence. Say, okay, good. We've got a little sentence on who you are. Uh, what are your, you know, who is your audience? Well, that's the science. We get that. Now, then, you know, as I said before, what are your actual aims? Oh, we wanted to say, no, no, let's write down your aims, your specific aims. And then finally, you know, what, we know who you are. What do you want to tell the world about yourself? And once you've got these three or four messages, always use, yeah, Apple is an example. It was always, you know, it's just two words, think different. And, and that informed everything that Apple did from its design. And it took that one phrase, took it from being something functional that was a bit natty into a, a lifestyle choice, mm -hmm. you know, two words. So it's about, words are so important. It's about the, really refining those three or four messages that you want the world to know about you. And then that should, that should 
um, that should go that which should should feed through into everything that you produce. Every time you produce a piece of work, is this telling the world this message about mm -hmm. us as a business? And, and a lot of people forget that. They just go on to automatic pilot and they forget the. So I used to have quite fun with this corporate therapy. And sometimes you'd, you'd be there for hours and hours and hours. Um, so that's what I, that's how I started. Yeah, yeah. And then no one would listen and I'd write the same old stuff and it goes to compliance <laughs> and then I had to write a book about it. <laughs> uh, tricky clients, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Richard about this. Mm -hmm. um, your firm, Jumping, produces, pr promotes these white papers to the media. But um, no matter how well your PR professionals do, um, how, uh, clients must sometimes say to you, look, you haven't really got me as much publicity as we wanted for this white paper. Well, for, for the avoidance of doubt, for anybody that may be listening, none of our clients are tricky, they're all amazing. <laughs> 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 and, 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 talking hypothetically. We love them dearly. In the event right. that that was ever to happen. Um, it does happen, actually. And the situation arises because sometimes the head office can create some content that gets passed down from one region to the next, ends up in the UK, and um, the, the internal team and then ourselves have to, to do something with it. Um, I think it's about managing expectations, but then you can't absolutely predict what's going to be receptive, what's going to happen. Um, especially with today's news. There's, there's a lot of luck involved. It's, uh, there's, there's, absolutely, mm -hmm. it's an art and a science. And there's so much going on in the news agenda. Um, you can't predict the out outcome or the reaction. But I think that if you don't get the response that you expect or that you reasonably estimate is going to be the case, find another angle. Look again. Find that thing. And I think it's, sometimes it's a matter of, matter of just really honing in, as we've all said, on the audience, what is the audience most likely to be interested in? It may not be the headline that's been provided or the, the angle that's been suggested by the author of the white paper or the authors of the white paper, mm. but try and get under the skin of um, the actual target audience. What is it within yeah. this white paper or this long form aspect that's going to be of consequence mm -hmm. then? Yeah. I, I tell you the truth too, another great thing. We say the folks come in and do commission white papers these days and they don't even have a decent case study. So we say to folk, if you're going to start putting an editorial shoe letter into stuff and commissioning stuff, you should really get that story straight. Yeah. Because folks are great stuff, with real living examples yeah. of stuff you've done, real chances and benefits and outcomes, you know. Stories of people. Mm. If people want to hear about people, it's like photographs. You never look at they come up in the whole history of landscapes. You're only <laughs> in the world of people, aren't you? It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. I think as well. There's, yeah. there's something quite useful you can tell when an editorial response is negative to a white paper. Mike, you were saying that paid for media can be expensive. Yeah. We always advocate that when you've got a long form asset or any asset, offering it to the media first is going to give it a better chance because it's not all new, it's still new. Mm. But the second thing is you can find out from the editorial team who know really, really well what appeals to readers, which bit is interesting. And if none of it's interesting, then don't go and spend 100,000 pounds yeah. yeah. promoting yeah. it on, yeah. on something else. Yeah. Re regroup. So use yeah. that insight, that panel of experts to help shape your strategy. Very good point. It's not always bad when the answer is no. Mm. Well, I've got a question here for Charlie. The best and the worst. Um, you've read a lot of white papers in your time. I don't know if you added it up, it'd be a lot of wasted oh, days okay. of your life. So, what, what's the can, without naming names mm. comes and produce them? What, can, what would you say is the best white paper you've ever received, and what's the worst? If you want to focus on the worst. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, <laughs> there is a fact, really. Um, names been changed, but guilty. Uh, I think, I, I think the worst are always. It's more about how they're delivered as well. So the worst are always the long-winded ones. They're always the bombs. On the ones they don't really, they're not really telling you anything, and yet they're sent to you in a way that this is incredibly important and you should be writing about it. And there's been no, and what Richard does, that build up of relationship from that comes to say, mm -hmm. this is what you write about, this is why it's interesting for your reader. Yeah. So it's thoughtlessness. Yeah, yeah. The work. I, I can't think of a specific one, but the specific type of worst white paper would be a white paper with lots of white space that the, where the designer's gone overboard, lots of pretty pictures. Right. And it's obviously been written by a marketing person, not a proper writer. So that's, that's what I'm getting at. So Mike? Yeah, but it, it comes back to the purpose, really. So, you know, not all white papers are equal. Um, so the best one I've read, it was one we wrote, but the one that I wrote was actually the FCA. wrote a fantastic one on machine learning last year. And I thought it was a really interesting paper. 
it was a round table that we have to have to be chairing um, as part of the FTA piece of machine learning. And so it was a really, it's a difficult topic that they tackled and tackled it really well. And uh, and that was um, an in-house folk who did that there. Very, very good. Um, but in, in terms of, of you know the formatting and the visual stuff. It really depends. It's horses for courses, you know, camels. So <laughs> you know, some folk will want infographics, pictorially led, something engaging. Some folk will want that. Now, one of our clients, um, a U.S. technology company in the fintech space, we wrote a very technical um, uh, white paper, and it really was a white paper uh, about a particular piece of regulatory change, and there was no visual. It's been hugely successful. We did another one for a client, very visual. Now it's hugely successful. So I think it suits the tone and voice of the publisher and the audience. It, 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 there's no one size fits all with that, I don't think. So, yeah, the best ones are the ones that make me look good in front of other people. So I can get the information in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Chance favours the prepared mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, do you have a best and the worst, Richard? Um, or just the worst well, or the just first, the best? The first I ever worked on was a project called Mouse Rage. It was at a time when road rage was all in the headlines. Yeah. And there were lots of stories about road rage and examples of people going crazy when somebody's uh, um, done something wrong on the road. And so it was very, very topical. And we, our client at the time was an IT infrastructure company that was focused on e-commerce. We got a professor from Cambridge University to do a test in a room not dissimilar to this, where we got lots of students to do an online treasure hunt. They had to find products from different online websites. We monitored their heart rate, muscle tension, sweat, stress levels. We produced pictures, to your point about pictures, mm -hmm. the pictures, the graphics, but they were interesting. We created a white paper that's called Mouse Rage, and it defined, we established, that if you looked at it from the perspective that we were, then Mouse Rage was more stressful than getting a divorce. And the press went nuts. They loved the images, they loved the pictures. They loved the pictures. I found my favorite white paper. <laughs> it, was, it was such a, a, a great feeling to see that conversation ignited by this wacky idea. And it was a fun way of addressing something quite boring, which is yeah. IT infrastructure performance. Yeah, yeah but that, that was a superb yeah. job. You've just, it was so yeah. much fun. Brilliant. 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 Okay, look, we've uh, almost run out of time, so I'd just like to ask the three of you one final question, which is to say for all of you, um, keep your answers to about half a minute maximum, please. And it's very simple. Uh, Mike Morton of Ditto. Um, you've given our listeners the benefit of your expertise in the past hour, right. so um, there's a lot for them to consider. What would you say is the most important piece of advice they should heed when writing a white paper? Yeah, just do it and do it well. Don't overcomplicate it. Sit down with a pen and pad now and take the five things you want to make, the five points, whether, you know, what's my customer's challenges, how do I fix it, what's the benefit, what role do we play, and how do you want to find out more? Anyone can fill those bits in. Then you can put even contributors against those five pieces. Make it five. <laughs> if you can't do five, do three. So I say do it, do it well and start the process. Okay, thanks. Charlie? I say think forensically about your audience and you what, what what you want your white paper to do. I would say again everything that that, that Mike just said. Um, I would say be original, as Richard was just saying about mouse rage, and everything. Just say something interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Richard, your key takeaway for listeners: outsource. Don't do this internally. Get an expert in. Get a partner that can look objectively at what's going on in their media, what's going on inside your business, and who can. Be um, critical of the input that's been given. Well, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. That was uh, fascinating. Um, although I've been a reader and writer of white papers for many years, I've learned a few <laughs> external <laughs> things myself. There's got to be called six quid a word, then, is it, Michael? <laughs> yes, but it's not my um, This has been a live broadcast. Uh, it's been recorded, though, and it's going to be yeah. uploaded to the Ditto website, and it's going to be available from tomorrow yeah. uh, for you to um, listen to again if you wish or to share with your colleagues. Our next spotlight will be about financial regulation and RegTech uh, Monday, the 17th of That's June, right, I yes. believe. And, um, and if you haven't already received a notification about this, you can find full details by going onto the Ditto website and clicking on the Spotlight tab at the top of the page. So that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Mike Wilson, Charlie Corbett, and Richard Cook. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mike. Thank you.